Well, good morning, everyone. People are still joining us, so we're going to be getting going here. Um, if you've just joined us and you want to hear about skunks, you are in the right place. I'm Emily Burns. I'm the program director for Sky Island Alliance. And today we're going to be hearing from Megan Bethel, who is our superstar wildlife specialist based here in Tucson. Megan and I are both in Tucson, and so is the primary Sky Island Alliance office. And we want to acknowledge that this Tucson is uh, on native land of the Tahan Otham and the Pascua Yaqui and other indigenous peoples. And our wildlife research and conservation programs happen both in Sonora, Arizona, and New Mexico. And all of our work is happening on native land. This morning, we're going to have an exciting look at skunks of our region, the Sky Island region. And these are just one of um, our favorite species that we get on our wildlife cameras. And Megan has been studying them for many years. Uh, you're in really good hands with Megan. She is the, the expert on skunk identification. She always can help us figure out which species we're looking at. And I hope that's one of the things you leave with this morning, a better understanding of the skunks in our region and how to tell them apart. You're also going to hear about our research and what we're learning about skunks and then how you can get involved. We would love to answer your questions at the end. So anytime during Megan's presentation, you're welcome to type in a question here in Zoom or if you're watching on Facebook Live, feel free to type it in there and um, Megan will answer those questions at the end. Megan um, has been recovering her voice. So if for some reason Megan feels like her voice needs a bit of a rest, I'm gonna jump in. But otherwise, Megan, take it away. Yeah, good morning, everyone. And as Emily said, I am recovering my voice. So I need to have to pause to cough or drink some tea I have right here, uh, please forgive me. But thank you for joining me today. <clears throat> I'm really excited to talk about these skunks because they're a really fun creature, especially on wildlife cameras. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Oops, I turn on the right thing. So first, I get um, to talk about skunks in general. There's four different genuses in the Mephitidae family. That's where the skunks are in the Mephitis Mephitidae family. Most of them are in the Americas. So we have three of the main genuses. <coughs> excuse me, in the Americas, North America and South America, with the most of the diversity being in Central America and where the Sky Islands are. Additionally, there's one other little genus called the Midas. Uh, genus, and those are stink badgers, oops, uh, or hog badgers, stink badgers, which are just, just got added to the Mephitidae family because of uh, genetic diversity. I'll show a picture in a little bit, um, but it's crazy how with DNA evidence, we can see what is related to one another. But as you see, most of it is in the Americas, which is really uh, special. And looking at skunks and where they are in the genetic tree, um, they're related to uh, Weasels, you might hear them in the Mostelidae superfamily. Um, they, they used to be thought they were weasels themselves, but through more genetic studies and evidence, they're in their own little group. But one wild thing I learned is that they're actually more closely related to red pandas than like a badger. But they all have these similar body structures. They're low to the ground, they forage. And a lot of times when I'm describing what skunks look like, I might use terms like, hey, look like a honey badger. They look like a, a ferret or a weasel because they are cousins, um, but they are in their own little group, the skunks. Also the Procyonidae, like the raccoons and coatis, they're also pretty closely related to these skunks, which is really kind of fun. If you think about the evolutionary track these animals are all on. Here's some other fun cousins of skunks. They're not skunks themselves, but they all kind of have that similar build. Let's go back to the Mephitidae family themselves. Mephitidae is what we call skunks. Um, like I showed in the map, there's Mephitis, the Compatis, Spirogale, and Midos. That Midos is that hog stink badger up in the top uh, left corner. They're in the uh, Malaysian Peninsula, so we're not going to talk about them today since they're not in our region, but it's kind of fun to bring them up and point them out that they are related to these the guys we have here. Uh, there's 12 species total in that family, and four of them live in our Sky Island region, which is southern Arizona and northern Sonora and Chihuahua. They're all pretty much known for their black and white pattern patterning <clears throat> that's very distinctive. And it's an aposematic coloring. Uh, it's a warning to uh, deter predators away. 
Um, so it's like a just like a bee or a wasp, they have that really uh, black, black and yellow defense, the same as this white and yellow or white and black here. And it's warning predators away from their very infamous and famous uh, stink anal glands. Um, if, if you know about skunks, they like to spray, and that's what people mostly associate skunks with is them spraying and you having to wash your dog or your pets or whatever. Um, but it is a really effective defense against predators and against people. Um, so I appreciate that they're they're pretty colorful to show that they have that that bad side. And um, here's some fun photos. They like to do handstands. The spotted skunk is the most famous for the little handstands. They'll go on their hind legs or the front legs as a warning before they start spraying. But we've seen it in other skunk species. The one in the background or from our wildlife cameras of a striped skunk posturing and warning something off screen that it's going to spray soon. Unfortunately, I don't know what it was. Hopefully, they didn't get skunked. And before you ask, uh, I'm not going to focus too much on the, the stinky side of skunks during this presentation because the beauty of wildlife cameras is that you don't have to worry about that. Um, our cameras are out here 24 seven and they're safe <laughs> from being sprayed because they're just passively in the environment. But if you are curious, there's lots of recipes online about how to get skunk out of your dog or your clothes or whatever. Um, but I like skunks a lot because you can see them up close and I really appreciate how fluffy and cute they are without ever worrying about <coughs> being sprayed. At least for wildlife cameras. So just to talk about the life of skunks, at least in um, the Americas, I found this really funny quote online when researching this, saying that they're short-sighted and self-absorbed, which is a little anthropomorphic, but I feel like it does summarize what a skunk is pretty well. Um, they do have poor vision and um, kind of hearing, but their, their scent is really good. So they're always focusing on, on the ground, Looking for um, uh, looking for prey and uh, food, and they're self-absorbed because they trust that their black and white coloring and their scent will keep predators away. Uh, they're nocturnal, so you mostly will always see them at night. Um, sometimes they'll come out during the evenings or morning hours to to look for more food or find mates, but almost always you'll see them at night. And a lot of our photos are at night. They den in burrows, logs, and under rocks. Um, during the day, if you're in the more rural areas, they might den under your um, your porch or any other sheds like that too. They like to live underground. Uh, they're omnivores. <clears throat> they'll eat just about anything. A lot of times they'll eat grasshoppers, grubs, mice, uh, eggs, if they can find them, lizards, as well as carrion, like along the side of the road or whatever is left over by bigger predators, as well as garbage. They're pretty tenacious and well-adapted little creatures, so they'll eat just about anything they can find. And a lot of that is on the ground, so that's why you'll see them on the ground foraging, very focused on what they're trying to eat. But uh, the skunk smell doesn't deter everything. Um, actually, a lot of things eat skunks, which I was surprised to hear. Uh, great horned owls and eagles are their main predator, and just because raptors don't have as developed of a olfactory senses. They can't smell as well as mammals, so they don't even care that the skunks have that really potent odor, odor which is, unfortunate for the skunks, but um, a lot of bigger mammals will also eat skunks if they're desperate. Coyotes, mountain lions, bobcats, badgers even. Um, they specifically will target younger skunks because they don't have that fully developed anal gland um, and they're not as smelly, but adult skunks will also get nabbed too. They're, they're pretty small. They're not the large of creatures out there. So let's dive into the four skunks of the Sky Island region. First, I'm going to talk about how to identify them in the section, and then we'll talk about where we see them uh, in our data. So let's first get started with the American hognose skunk. This one's a pretty fun, distinctive uh, guy in the Conepatis genus. It's the only hognose skunk in North America. The rest are in South America and Central America. And I call this one a very badger-like skunk. He's, they're very robust. They have a big, stocky build because they do a lot of foraging and digging in the dirt. Um, Another pretty obvious thing is that they are, they have a hog nose, which means like a really bare, larger uh, snout, which kind of looks like a pig nose. And another thing I like to look at is that they have shorter, like denser fur. They're not as like obviously fluffy. So here on these top ones, you can kind of see they almost have like a buzz cut on the top of their head and then going back. Um, just that really short, dense white fur. Um, the last thing I like to point out for hog nose skunks is that they have 
an all white tail. They'll always have white, an all white tail. See on all these four pictures, there's a, um, you don't see really any black on them. And the tail, if you imagine laying it across the top of its body, it's shorter than the body of these. Get out of the way, my cat just shut up. <clears throat> so that's the hognose skunk. I always look at the tail length and then how the stocky build and the fur length is what I always try to uh, determine. Oops. Oh, here's just another picture of a non-wildlife photo, or a wildlife camera photo of a hognose skunk. Um, just to see those traits a little bit more clearly. Here you can see the, the big bear nose as well as the all white tail that's pretty short compared to the rest of its body. And this picture too, you can see how well developed their front claws are. <clears throat> all skunks have pretty robust claws to dig and forage on the ground. Bahagdo skunks are most known for their longer claws because they are the ones that are foraging most. The next, um, I think this is the most distinctive skunk species we have here and it's most easily identifiable is the Western spotted skunk. There are four, I think four or five spotted skunk species. Um, there's one in the Eastern US and there's a couple more South into Mexico and Central America. But here in the West Coast, we have the Western spotted and they have that really beautiful marbled pattern on their coats. And they are no, they're called spotted skunks because they have a spot between their eyes, um, if that helps you remember it at all. And they have kind of a short fan-like tail to describe it. And they have a much different like lifestyle. They're much more active. They will hunt um, a lot more like moving prey, like mice and grasshoppers. So all of our pictures, they're almost always moving in little blurs, um, little marbled blurs. And I think one of the reasons why they're so much more active is that they're a lot smaller than most of the other skunk species. Here's a, a side by side photo of a hognose skunk and a spotted skunk in the same camera, same, mostly the same location. And you can see like the, hog, the spotted skunk is less than half, or like more than half, the, or, I can't, I can't talk more, half the size of the hognose skunk. So they're pretty little um, and they're pretty unmistakable if you see them out and about. I like them a lot, they're really cute. They might be like a ferret, sort of. Next, Next we'll go into the more tricky to identify skunk species. Um, this, these next two are the Mephitis uh, genus and they're cousins essentially. So that's why they look pretty similar. This is the striped skunk. When you hear skunk or you see a skunk in media or on TV, this is probably the species that you associate with, like this, the common skunk, because they're across most of North America. Um, you'll see them back East, you'll see them up in Canada. For some reason, they're not in that little great basin, really dry part of California and Nevada, but they're certainly here in the US and the Sonoran region. Um, and I think the best thing to look, always look for first on the striped skunk is that black stripe that runs along the, their back. It, they'll always have that to some degree on their bodies. So that black right on the rump going up the tail and then those two white kind of Y shaped colorings on the side. Another thing is that they'll always have a little face stripe. Both the Mephitis species have face stripes. And that's the best way to tell them apart from the hognose skunk. The hognose skunk doesn't have any stripe, just that big bare nose. <clears throat> and for striped skunks, their tail is another thing to look at. If you imagine, again, laying the tail over the top of the body, minus the big long fur at the end of the tail, it's about the same length, if maybe around the same length as their body length. And this will come in handy with our next species. But I always pay attention to that black stripe along the butt. Um, that's pretty indicative of a striped skunk. Mm -hmm. However, that stripe, it's never easy uh, with mammals or biology, and it can vary. These are all striped skunks that we've seen on our cameras. Um, and that width of that black stripe and the white on each side varies individual to individual. Um, sometimes it can be really wide, really obviously black. And then here on this top right one, that's there's barely any blacks there, but you can still kind of see it. Another thing that I've heard about striped skunks is that their body is proportionally larger than their tail, so they look kind of fat. However, I don't think that's the best trait to go off of because sometimes like the coat can change or if there's body condition, if they're not eating enough or eating too much species to species, I don't think that's quite reliable, but that's something to keep in mind. Um, these are just some cool skunks. And then on the bottom too, you can see the little face stripe as well, if that ever comes to question. <clears throat> 
So next is the hooded skunk. This is the other cousin of the Mephitis family, Mephitis macrura. These are a um, Mexican or a Southern or Central American skunk. They're mostly in Mexico, but they are in South Southern Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. Um, they are around, and they, I think they're really cool because they have the longest tail of any of the skunk species. So if you see them on camera, they have these huge plumes of fur. And they're off, and they're also the fluffiest. They have the most fur of any of the skunks for some reason, even though they're a set, like a southern species, which is kind of interesting. Um, like the striped skunk, they'll always have a little face stripe going down their nose. So you can see it really clearly on these uh, two on the right. Um, but the one tricky thing with hooded skunks is that they have a variable pattern. The two most common are they have either a white back and like a whitish tail, or they have a black back with these kind of white side stripes. So you got the two on the top have that white on the top, and the two on the bottom have that white on the sides. So not separate species, they're still the same striped skunk, but individual by individual can vary. And you could have any combination of those two stripe patterns. These are all hooded skunks we have seen on our cameras. And it's kind of crazy how much variation there can be in just in these animals. Um, but if you look at all of them, they all have that same really long fluffy tail. Their overall, their body has a lot longer hair, like compared to like a pogno skunk or even a striped skunk. Um, they're just very fluffy. I would love to pet them if they weren't smelly. Um, but keep in mind, if you see a skunk that has really wide range of patterns and there's different skunks around, um, it's gonna be a, a hooded skunk. And they're called hooded because they have, a lot of these have kind of like a white kind of hood on the back of their neck and head. You can kind of see it in these middle um, skunks and some of the more black ones, they always have that kind of like white hood, but not all of them have it, never simple. <clears throat> but I love hooded skunks. They're a really interesting species and not a lot of no is known about them, especially in the Southwest. So uh, a little later in our presentation, we'll talk about where we see them. And here's just another graphic I made a couple of years ago of what I had observed of different hooded skunk patterns. This is on our website. And since I made this a couple of years ago, I've already found more combinations. So essentially it's it's a variation between the racing stripe and the white back. And they all have like this really cool striping. And it'd be cool to do the genetics someday of these guys. See what, what's happening with those patterns. Oh, but they'll always have a little white stripe down their face. So if that ever comes, if you can see their face and you see that stripe, it's, a, it's one of the mephitis, um, either hooded or striped. So keep that in mind. However, uh, I have to admit, skunk ID is really tricky. <clears throat> it takes practice, and I've been doing this for 10 years, and there are sometimes where there's photos of, I just don't know. Um, these, I don't know if you believe me, but all these pictures on the side are different species, but they all look pretty much the same. Um, so on the, on the left, that is a striped skunk. On the top right is a hooded, and the top or the bottom left, or bottom right, sorry, is the hogno skunk. Um, but they all have that white back. So just keeping in mind all those traits of like the tail length, the fur length, um, as well as just general patterning will really help you with skunks. <clears throat> and that was a really brief overview of how to identify skunks. But if you would like to learn more, and to dive deep into skunk ID. I have a lot of resources on our Sky and Alliance website. Um, I've assembled a wildlife ID guide going more into depth on skunks where it points out the traits again on a PDF, which you're welcome to look at, as well as I have a uh, past coffee break webinar where I've um, gone in depth through this um, web, the PDF describing what I look at and different um, tips and tricks that I like to recommend as well as that hooded skunk graphics. So I really recommend if you want to learn more about how to ID skunks, check those out or just email me. I'm happy to uh, go more into depth, but a lot of it is just practice. So if you have skunks in your camera, just keep at it and try to spot those really slight little differences between them. <clears throat> so I'm just going to transition into our more data side and drink some tea real fast. So we, we have all four skunks in the Sky Island region, um, but they're not found everywhere in this area. A lot of times their preferred habitat are wooded areas, grasslands, and scrublands. They like having um, some tree cover and some woody cover. 
just for uh, protection, as well as that's where they find most of their food. That's where the eggs and the grubs and the insect will be. They tend to not be in more arid locations. In, in the West, they don't seem to be more in the, they don't seem to be in the rural or in the urban sections. I'll talk about more about that later too. Uh, spotted skunks prefer more mountainy, rocky regions. Um, they like being in the canyons in kind of the more cliff sides. Uh, they can even climb trees because they're very agile and dexterous little skunks. Um, and one thing I've noticed is that striped skunks in the eastern United States are adapting well to being in suburban areas. If you see reports of skunks and how to manage skunks, it's usually back east where they're in suburbs in trash cans and stuff. Um, but that's another kind of question I'm curious about is where are skunks in the Skyland region and are they in town or not? And one thing I kept re reading when I was researching these skunks is striped skunks are the most common species in Arizona. And I'm sure that's true, especially up north. Like just looking at the striped skunk range at the bottom, they're all over North America. So I, I don't, I'm sure that's true to an extent, but I didn't know if that's true for our Southern Scott Island region. So these next couple of slides are gonna be looking to see if that's true or not. Is if our striped skunks the most common or is it a different species? <clears throat> so first I'm going to be looking at our border wildlife study data. Our border wildlife study has been going on for three years um, in uh, the Patagonia, San Rafael, and Huachuca Mountain area, uh, right along the border uh, between Nogales and Sierra Vista. We have over 60 cameras set in a systematic grid. So they're randomly placed on the landscape. And they've been collecting data for three years, essentially, now. And for this talk, I'm just going to group it into three sections, just to, for, for sake of comparison. So the Patagonia Mountains, the San Rafael Valley, and the Huachuca Mountains. So this is um, a bunch of little pie graphs, and each pie graph represents the different region. So going from left, we have the Patagonias. In the center is the San Rafael, and on the right are the Huachuca Mountains cameras. And each color is a different species. And the numbers, uh, the number on each uh, section of the pie graph is the number of photos taken in by the cameras in those regions. Um, but the numbers are not as important as the comparison between the pie slices themselves. Across all three, hooded skunks are what we see the most, um, especially in the Patagonia and the San Rafael. They're the predominant skunk species, which is really cool. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And then followed by the hognose skunk, which is the second most common. So that kind of goes against our the hypothesis that the striped skunks are the most common. So that's, we'll put a pin in that. Uh, but it's kind of interesting to see this in this little section of the region that's the stripe or the hooded skunk um, is the it's by far the most prevalent. Um, in the in the Patagonias in San Rafael, the uh, spotted skunk isn't as common, which is to be expected because our, a lot of our cameras are not in those rocky canyon areas where you might expect to see them. However, if you go to the far right in the Chuka Mountains, it's a little bit different story. Um, there's a lot more hogno skunks for whatever reason in that camera location, um, camera locations. And there's a lot more spotted skunks. Huachucas have a lot more walk, rocky canyons and where our cameras are, they're a little bit more, uh, they have that habitat that spotted skunks like, so that I kind of was expected. But still striped skunks are not as common as I was expecting. Um, but all these locations have all four, which is really, really cool. Um, there's not a lot of research about how these species interact with each other, but they seem to be getting along, getting along fine. Um, there's not a lot of competition, I guess, um, between the skunks, at least. That's a whole other <laughs> question on its own. And here are some photos of the different landscapes you can see too. So next I want to look at our other um, systematic uh, study site is the San Bernardino National Wildlife Refuge. This is um, a a few miles east of Douglas at the San Bernardino uh, Wildlife Refuge. And we also have a system of uh, a grid of cameras there uh, randomly placed collecting the same data just in a different location in Arizona. And this region is very different than our main border wildlife study. It's much more arid. There's like lots of uh, creosote and acacia flats, it's drier. However, at this refuge, there is an oasis of um, natives, um, cienegas. Uh, that's why it's been made a wildlife refuge. It's a really interesting little spot. It's perennial water year round. Um, so it's different, but there's still water. And what we saw in the data is very different too. 
Here, striped skunks are the most common. Um, there's almost half of our detections are striped skunks, which was uh, kind of cool, uh, especially after doing three years of uh, the main border of our life study, like all seeing, seeing, seeing all these striped skunks are really fun. However, all four are still, are still present. We have the hooded skunk second, hogdo skunk there in pretty equal measure. And there is a little bit of a spotted skunk in one of our one of the camera locations that's kind of more in a wetter canyony wash area. So that's where that one's been showing up. But it's completely different than our other camera set. So that made me wonder is which is the norm? Is it this uh the San Bernardino, which is not in that San Rafael Valley? Is this what's typical for Arizona? Or is it the San Rafael side and the, the Huachuca Mountains? Is that more typical of what we see in skunks? Unfortunately, to answer that question, we need more data. And we do have more data, fortunately, through photofauna. If you're not already familiar with photofauna, it's a community network of uh, cameras that are operated by volunteers, partners, staff, anyone. And they submit a monthly checklist indicating what species show up on their cameras. It's a yes or no. Um, and then you submit a photo as proof if you have seen that species. And it's become a valuable resource to us and other partners, anyone who wants to use this data on the, on the, to see where species are showing up on the landscape. <clears throat> so this map here is a map of all the surveys submitted um, that have indicated they've had a skunk at some point in time. And that's 690, or 639 surveys. And you can see they range all the way up through North, like central Arizona, <clears throat> but most of them are in Tucson, the North border, uh, some in New Mexico, thank you for submitting New Mexicans, as well as in Sonora. So it's a pretty good range, um, but let's look at each species specifically. Here's a little over pie, pie chart again. So these are the number of photofauna surveys that have indicated what species is present on those um, checklists. And uh, I think this is pretty interesting results. Um, the most common skunk is the hooded skunk, um, which I, there's a lot of, I don't know what that means. Is it, does that mean that the, the hooded skunk is the most common or do we need more data and more collection points to see is the striped skunk more common or whatnot? But after the hooded, there's the hognose, which is a lot more common than I was expecting um, across the whole region. They're, they're out there. Then followed by the striped skunk and then the spotted skunk. So I, I can't say for certain that hooded skunks are the most common skunk in the Sky Island region, but at least based on our data, that seems to be the case is that the hooded skunks are the most prevalent, at least in the southeastern part of Arizona and northern Sonora, which is really cool because the hooded skunk is a really as well studied or well known as the striped skunks um, and I feel like they need more credit that they're out there on the landscape. Uh, also I think everyone needs more practice on identifying what a hooded skunk looks like. So if you google hooded skunk they're all striped skunk pictures. I'm like no. So it's just kind of it's kind of neat. So these are really cute hooded skunk. I like them a lot. They're really fluffy uh, especially since you don't have to worry about getting sprayed by them. However, <clears throat> while there's skunks everywhere on the landscape, they are still at risk from humans, but primarily. They're all four here in the Skylands are listed as least concern on the red list, but they still face threats that we should be aware of and um, that are declining or they're decreasing their populations. So primarily it's disease, especially rabies is a really hard hitting um, disease on skunks. In Arizona, bats, skunks, and foxes are the primary vectors. Uh, for rabies and it's a fatal disease so once they get it there's you can't survive it um so if you do see a skunk out during the daytime and it's acting weird stay away that's usually a rabid skunk um i've unfortunately seen dead skunks that probably have succumbed to rabies um and it's unfortunate fact of life being here in the southwest but uh they do have other diseases as well and they they have they have a heart and unfortunately, another huge impact to skunks is habitat fragmentation, um, especially roads and roadkill. I'm sure anyone who's driven around Arizona at some point has seen or smelt a skunk that's been hit on the road. And they seem particularly hit hard by roads for whatever reason. There's not a lot of like conclusive studies of why they're just so affected by and it's like so uh, impacted by roads. But some theories I was reading is that it's mating season in the spring. They tend to be out uh, traveling more and looking for mates and they're a little bit more self-centered um, and focused on looking, following those pheromone trails and they just don't notice the roads. 
Another theory I saw is that it's the fall foraging season. They're out looking for food. A lot of these um, roadsides have nice mown grass where insects will like to hang out or there's wildflowers just because of the disturbed soil. So it's perfect for a lot of these lizards and, rept um, and insects that the skunks like to eat. And so unfortunately not having great vision, they just, they don't have a, they don't have a chance against cars. Um, and there's a, there is a studies about doing road mitigation, like having crossings underneath and um, under them, but let's just give the skunk a chance. If you see one crossing the road, do break for it, <laughs> give, let it go. One other thing that has been interesting with photofauna is that it's collecting data across the whole region where we can't put the systematic grid. And one thing I've been keeping track of are skunks in urban areas, um, specifically Tucson, just because that's where I live. Um, and I've, growing up here, I've noticed there's never really any skunks or skunk sightings. Um, I feel like you, when you hear back east, you're like, oh, there's a skunk in my trash, or you see pictures of it more um, in more developed suburban areas, but not in Tucson. So. Using photofauna, I've been keeping track over the years of where we see skunks. And lo and behold, I had a camera at my parents' house and a couple years ago, we got a skunk. I never knew that. I grew up in that same neighborhood my whole life. And until we put a camera out, I would we didn't know that there was a striped skunk hanging out right in our front yard. However, um, unfortunately, I think about a year later, I saw a skunk hit on Fort Lowell Road. And I'm, I'm assuming it's probably that same individual. And so these roads and grid networks in the West, especially in Tucson, are really hard on these skunks because there's just no, no way to cross the road, essentially. And here are uh, hooded skunk sightings, just because there seems to be more hooded skunks in um, the Sky Island region. We do have a couple more sightings in town, specifically south of the Rito River. Uh, there's another one at Valley of the Moon, which is a uh, kind of nature historical park. And we had an observation in central Tucson um, by Abby a couple of years ago. And both of these skunk sightings are near washes. One's near the Tucson High Wash and one's pretty close to Rito. So I'm, I hypothesize that they're using these riparian natural uh, mesquite washes to travel throughout town, which might might be the, uh, the way that they're getting through. Um, so it's just kind of interesting that there are, at least you can see a lot of little red points, those are other surveys that have skunks, which are more in the urban or sorry, more in the rural locations, but I think that that grid system of town is what's keeping them out. However, this is this, this is based on the data we have. Um, there might be more skunks in Tucson that we, know, we just don't know about because we don't have photo evidence or we don't have um, sightings of them. So if you have a wildlife camera out, or if you're interested in putting a wildlife camera in your backyard, just try to document skunks or to see the KD of striped skunks, do you have hooded skunks? What's in your area? Um, join Photofauna. <clears throat> like that's our community network of cameras where you submit just a uh, little checklist of what animals you see, yes or no, and you submit a picture. Um, I have a couple of cameras I operate personally. A lot of our staff members do too. And it's a great way to build this knowledge base of what animals are out there um, is the is the answer there's just not no skunks in Tucson or are we just not seeing them? Uh, I've already had a couple people email me and say, hey, I got my security camera documented a skunk like on Fort Lillian Mountain. If you operate that for a month, you can submit that with a photo fauna. So um, if anyone has any skunk sightings too, I'm personally collecting just anecdotal evidence. Um, so I love to hear it because um, the fun thing with skunks is that there's they're really cool creatures. And if you get um, if you have cameras operational um, month to month, you might get skunk bingo. This is one of the cameras I operate in the Patagonia mountains. And I call it skunk bingo is when you get all four in the same month. Um, so you have a hog nose on the top right, top left, top right is a hooded, bottom left is a spotted, and then the bottom right is a striped skunk. So I get excited because it's we have all four in this region and I just want to celebrate them. Okay. And here's a fun little uh, bingo chart we made if you ever want to keep track of that. And the benefits of wildlife cameras is that you get to document animals in their natural habitat or, or in their natural behaviors without having human disturbance. So like here's a nice little family of striped skunks, the mom in front with her two older kits following behind her. And we get to see really special moments. This is a, uh, I'm pretty sure it's a hooded skunk. I had to go back and forth a couple of times on it. But she's carrying a very little, little kit, little skunklet 
um, there was a series of like five or six photos. This was the best one of her going back and forth, back and forth. And she was moving her whole litter from a den site to another new den site. Maybe if there was a threat from a predator or she just had wanted to, wanted to move to a safer spot. But this was like a really special photo that we captured. It's in during the day and just to see that little, little, little guy. <laughs> it was really cute. Um, so that's a, one of the great things about wildlife cameras. You get to see that without, uh, without realizing. Also, another fun picture is behind me on my own background. There's a little teeny baby striped skunk. I had to make that as my backdrop for this presentation, too, just because they're so cute and fluffy. Uh, they don't make good pets, though. I have to say that right now. Um, you can get them these de de smelled, but they're wild animals. No matter how cute they are, don't get them as pets. <laughs> Disclaimer. So that's all for my presentation. Um, I'm happy to take any questions on skunk ID or our wildlife photo data. Um, I hope you learned something about the skunks in the region today. Thank you, Megan. And just to say out loud, we absolutely love all of your illustrations of skunks. Um, I think that your drawings really help distill down the different characteristics that these the species have that are unique. Um, so we love that. So big thumbs up for your your skunk artwork. We need more. <laughs> I'll try. Um, well, coming in on the chat, there's a comment that it's been tough this year, it sounds like, for baby skunk roadkill on 90 between Benson and Sierra Vista. So that seems like a common corridor where the skunks are trying to cross the road. So just a heads up on that. Um, and then um, Dale writes in and says that he had a hognose skunk and striped skunk foraging in the yard together the other night. And oh, wow. do, you, do you know whether that's common? Have you ever seen multiple species on camera together? I have not, at least on, on a camera. Um, There's certainly photos of like foxes and skunks and like raccoons and skunks, but that's actually really cool to have that same skunk and skunk interaction. They're territorial, but they're not that territorial. So I think I wouldn't be surprised. So that's really neat. Thank you for telling us. Yeah, fascinating. So what is it? Why do you think that some species like the fox, I know we've seen in photofauna, I think a spotted skunk and, and fox drinking together. Why do you think that they're able to coexist so peacefully? Um, I think the skunks trust a lot on their <laughs> their apomatic defense, uh, the, their coloring. And a lot of animals know not to mess with skunks. So um, especially a lot of the smaller carnivores like foxes and they're not, they're not good. Uh, like surprise attack of skunk. So they just not a prey species. So they tend to get along a little bit better. It's my, my assumption, um, at least. Mm -hmm. Well, you're getting a lot of appreciation for your great talk and folks hope you feel better. Oh, um, but we also have some more questions coming in. Um, there's an observation that spotted skunks have multiple spots where they bed down. And what do you know about that? Is something that is that consistent with maybe where they're foraging or that kind of behavior of where they're resting? Um, I'm not that familiar with that specific uh, species or their behavior, um, but I can hypothesize that a lot of mammals don't have like a specific, the same den site every single night. They're not like us who go to the same bed. They'll find wherever is comfortable for that evening uh, or for that deck day, excuse me, um, if it's safe from predators and they feel secure. So I can see that they'll move around um, time to time. A lot of mammals will do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can see like a female, when she has her kits, will have the same um, specific den site, but if they're sure. not ready. Okay. Well, we've got several questions about finding a camera. So you've convinced folks to put <laughs> out cameras <laughs> to watch for skunks. So what, can you say a little bit about how to choose a camera and what you might recommend? Yes. Um, first, I'll mention that Please go to our website uh, and go to our photo fauna page. We have a lot of resources on how to pick out a camera and set it up. Um, we have videos on how to do that as well as walkthroughs. But right now I'll recommend um, Browning tends to be a good brand. Any mid-range camera, about 150 or below, tends to be what we recommend. Uh, there's some really cheap cameras you can find online, but they don't tend to last or have as good night quality. And there's multiple brands out there, so we don't like to to promote one or the other, but any like $150, $100 um, camera is great. 
Um, people have also had success with the security cameras, like WISE cameras or um, things you can like wire into your Wi-Fi. As long as that they're set to somewhere where an animal would walk by, um, you can do that too. But yeah, check out our website. We have all our resources there. We purchase cameras for our research projects from trailcam pro.com and they have so many different options like Megan is describing and the research cameras that we've been using since 2020 like Megan said are the browning we've been using both strike force and dark ops and those have been pretty reliable for us and they're at that price point where we we can afford to replicate them in the fields as often as we do so those are great ones um, like Megan said Okay, another question about water features. So um, having water available out in the habitat, does that change the composition of skunk communities? You're muted, Megan. Yep, I'm sure it does. Uh, that would, if I wanna do more research on the specifics of where we see skunks, I could look at where our water is near our cameras or even look at our photofauna data where we indicate, have people indicate if there's water nearby. Because water will bring in anything um, and a lot of animals rely on it. So I'm sure that it does change the communities and what shows up there. Yeah, and just to that point, um, and I'm, I'll put the link in here. If you look at the photo fauna results page, the camera locations are color coded, whether they have water within 50 feet of the camera site or if there's no water within that that 50 foot distance. And if you click on a point, you can see which species are showing up. So I think it's a great question. We've been really curious about that, You know how much of a draw water is for different species. But so far with the, the analysis that we've done, we haven't seen any uh, striking patterns in terms of which species are showing up that close to water versus not. Generally, if a species is in that habitat, we'll see them even on a camera where there isn't water, but certainly water can be a draw. And it's always a good focal point um, to watch if you're putting a camera in your backyard. It's a, a great place to catch the animals moving through. Mm -hmm. And just to answer Daniel's question about, do they need freestanding water to survive? I haven't read anything, read anything during my research that they can. Um, they are larger mammals. Um, so I'm assuming they probably do need water every couple of days or every day, every couple of days to survive. Mm -hmm. They're not that desert adapted. <laughs> right. All right. Well, if you have any more questions, you're welcome to type it in the chat. Um, we will be sending out an email um, later today sharing the recording link. You're welcome to watch it again, refer to it if you have questions. You're also welcome to follow up with Megan or myself if you have more questions about skunks or joining photofauna. Just so you all know, our next coffee break will be happening on a Tuesday at the end of the month on Halloween, October 31st at 9.30 a.m. And this is going to be an overview of how to join our Huachuca Roads decommissioning project, how to actually go down to the area where Megan was sharing all this great skunk data and help us understand roads that have been assigned uh, for decommissioning status but need revegetation, oak trees planted, and physical closure to help that habitat recover. So if you're motivated to do some hands-on restoration work with us, we invite you to join that webinar or watch the recording and support our new Wichuca Roads rewilding campaign. So we hope to see you there. And um, thank you for joining us. I hope that your, your yard in your neighborhood is full of skunks and that that you get to enjoy them on camera soon. <laughs> Thank you, everyone.